Yes, hello, I'm William, uh, and I'm going to be talking about biometric passports. Um, biometric passports play a vital role in facilitating efficient and secure international travel. Um, but how secure are the documents themselves? Well, in this presentation, I'm going to be showing you just how worryingly insecure they actually are. We'll be looking at the security features, um, some attacks against them. And then finally, we'll look at the future of biometric passports um, and see some, some privacy issues there as well. But first, what is a biometric passport? Well, a biometric passport is a passport with an embedded chip that contains biometric data. Um, so this data might be, um, this data will include the, the information printed on the passport, a digital photo of the passport holder, and also digital signatures from the issuing country um, so that those who read the passport's chip can verify that the passport is an authentic passport. Um, issuing countries may also include um, in specified fields, fingerprints, iris scans, um, and pretty much whatever else they want to put in there um, because there's, there's free form fields as well. Um, so just a brief history. Um, the idea of having a machine readable passport came about in 1968, but this wasn't including biometrics or a chip. This was just a passport with a standardized area that the OCR technologies of the 80s would be able to scan and understand. Um, and it wasn't until 1988 when people started working on biometric systems. Um, Malaysia was the first country to actually introduce a biometric passport, um, and a lot of the technology that they used um, became part of the actual standard, which was published in 2006. So how does the passport data get used? Well, at the bottom of the passports, you, you see uh, here, there's the machine readable zone, um, which contains some data about the passport, um, which can be read using OCR, optical character recognition. And then from this data, both the scanner and the chip derive keys, uh, the document keys, um, and then perform a handshake to establish a secure channel, um, which I'll be discussing in just a moment. The scanner and the chip uh, verify the digital signatures uh, to ensure that the passport is authentic. Um, but after that, uh, it also needs to be verified that the person who is presenting the passport is actually the, the holder documented in the passport. Um, so then this is done perhaps at an e-gate with facial recognition or by a human officer. Um, finally, the system will check whether the holder is allowed into the country and, and let them in or not. Um, so before we discuss the security features, I've got a live demo. Somewhat abusing the, the NFC chip on my phone, um, I'm going to hopefully scan my passport. Um, I've already inputted the, the passport data um, from the machine readable zone, so the, key, the document keys can be derived. Um, and what my phone is going to do is perform the handshake as the scanner would at the airport, um, then transfer some of the data from the passport, and if all goes well, you should see my passport photo on my phone. So. Um, I don't know how well you, you'll be able to see, um, but it says the, the passport is being read, uh, the bytes are being transferred from the passport to my phone. Um, it's interesting that the, the actual standard for the chip in the passport is exactly the same as many other contactless um, devices, so um, bank cards, our cam cards all use the same standard, and there you go. My passport photo has been extracted um, from my passport using just my phone. So one of the primary um, mechanisms for establishing this secure channel is called basic access control. Um, and this is a way for using the, the document keys derived from the machine readable zone, the scanner and the chip um, can compute a shared secret from which they can derive the um, session keys. Um, so the document access keys are actually very simple to calculate um, from the machine readable zone. And as we'll see later, this is quite a problem, just how, how quick and easy it is. Um, you just put the passport number, date of birth, date of expiry together, hash it, um, put some stuff on the end and hash it again, and, and you've got the document access keys. Um, and then these keys are used um, as part of this process. Um, the actual exact details of the protocol aren't overly important, but the idea is that the passport generates a nonce, sends it to the 
scanner, which generates its own nonce and some keying material over here, um, encrypts it um, and signs it with the, the generates the um, message authentication code using the document access keys, sends this back over to the passport, um, which decrypts and verifies um, the nonce and the Mac uh, to, ver to prevent replay attacks and also um, to verify that the, um, the system actually does know the document access keys. And then it does effectively the same thing in reverse. They XOR their keying materials together and they have a seed from which the, um, the session key, encryption key and the session Mac key can both be derived using the same process uh, as we saw before. And then the send sequence counter, um, which is used to ensure that only one um, device uh, can be talking to the passport at once is also initialized. So this is used each time a packet is sent either way. The, um, the number will be incremented. So if the number is not what is expected, um, then you know someone else is, is trying to talk to the passport. And once this is all done, the rest of the passport data can be transferred using, using secure messaging. Um, so what this diagram is showing, this bit here is the standard um, um, packet, and then it is just encrypted. The header needs to be separate and the length fields and, and all those things. You add the um, send sequence counter on before you calculate the MAC and then send it across. Um, and then in this way, the, the scanner and the chip can communicate and, and transfer the necessary data to verify the passport. Um, so this is all good. We've established that the, um, the scanner is allowed to access the passport and the data can start being transferred, but we, we still need to verify the passport is authentic. Um, and this is done with, with passive authentication, um, where the, each country has a certificate authority which issues certificates to document signers, which are the um, organizations that uh, issue the passports. And each passport will be signed by one of these document signers. Um, and then the certificate that it was signed with, uh, along with signatures over hashes of all the different part bits of data in the passport, um, are contained within the document security object, which can be read um, just like any other data on the passport. And then when the system wants to verify um, the authenticity of the passport. Um, it's just a case of the, um, the system knows the, the root certificate for the country, um, which it will have obtained from a trustworthy source. Interestingly, the, the specification says this should be handed over in person at a, at a meeting, but I'm not sure how many countries would actually do that. Um, and then all the certificates down the chain can be verified and it can be verified that the passport is authentic. So that was all standardized in 2006. Um, and since then, there's been a number of uh, interesting attacks that have been found against it. So I'll be talking about three that I found particularly interesting. The first of which uh, is due to a, the, the machine readable zone contains the passport number and some other information. And if this information is predictive, predictable, um, then the keys that are generated um, are not as secure as you might hope. So they, they aren't too difficult to crack. Then the second attack I'll be talking about um, you measures the time taken for the passport to respond to different commands. Um, and as we'll see, this allows an individual passport to be traced. And then the final attack puts these two together and allows, without any eavesdropping uh, of the communication at the legitimate uh, inspection system, um, further timing analysis can recover all of the data in the passport anyway. So this first attack, published only a year after um, the specification was published. Um, the idea is at the airport uh, or, or the other uh, border, um, you eavesdrop the whole communication between the passport and the scanner, and then you can basically just brute force the keys. So this wouldn't be too big of a problem if the keys were difficult to brute force. Um, but the, the issue is, especially when this was first published, government just thought, oh, this, there's a new standard. Um, it adds some security features to the passport. This is great. Our passports are going to be more secure. Um, but the issue with that is 
the security of the passports depends on the entropy of the machine readable zone. And especially at the time, passport numbers were often sequential, had structure, maybe built in checksums, um, and other, in other ways were predictable. Um, especially if the passport numbers are sequential, then you can come up with some sort of dependency between the passport number and the expiry date. Um, so passports with higher numbers probably expire later because they were issued after. And given that you also have to intercept the communication at the airport, um, you might be able to narrow down the date of birth um, of the person as well. Um, and at the time, a lot of passports had these issues. So for example, um, when this was published in 2007, uh, in Germany, the first four digits of the passport number uh, corresponded to the local authority that issued the passport, and the remaining five digits were sequential. And then the Netherlands began with a fixed character um, and ended with a check digit. And it's interesting that they did put a check digit in because there's already one built into um, the passport. So a passport number is nine digits, and then the final digit is a check digit. So I'm not sure why they felt the need to add another one. Um, but in effect, it was shown that even in 2007, it was possible to crack the keys for the German passport in a little over 20 seconds on average, and a Dutch passport in less than half of that, um, using specialized hardware. And I'll talk about some of the mitigations for this um, in a moment. Um, but this, this, was not, this was not good, because once the, the keys have been cracked, um, firstly, that they contain um, the, the personal data, and secondly, if you've eavesdropped the whole conversation, um, you would then be able to derive the session keys um, in the same way that the chip did and read the rest of the data from the passport. So the second attack, uh, I think, is particularly interesting um, because it's something that was pointed out as a potential security flaw before biometric passports even came about. So if you, li if you listen to a certain part of the um, key exchange, um, you, can, you will have a packet that contains um, some data and a valid message authentication code on the end. Um, and if you then send this to the chip, you start your own exchange and send this data to the chip, um, the chip will verify that the, the code is valid because it was generated with the correct document access keys, um, but the nonce will obviously be wrong um, because um, that needs to be checked as well to prevent replay attacks. But the issue with, with this, as you might be able to guess looking at this graph, is that depending on whether um, or not the, the Mac is wrong, um, the chip takes a different amount of time to respond. And this is actually because um, the chip checks the message authentication code before it compares the nonces. So if the code is valid, it takes longer to respond um, because it gets on to comparing the nonces and has to do that. Um, and this could be used to, um, for example, build a bomb that detonates in the presence of a specific person with their passport. Um, this, is, this is something that was actually highlighted as a threat before biometric passports even started to be um, introduced. And it's interesting that this was actually an attack that could theoretically have been possible. Um, all 10 passports that the authors tested were vulnerable. And something I thought was fun was that the French passport, you didn't even need to do any of the timing analysis. It explicitly told you what was wrong. Um, so that's, that's another, another interesting attack. And finally, um, an attack that combines the two. Um, instead of um, worrying about comparing the nonce after the message authentication code, um, if you analyze in even more depth the timing, depending on which byte of the message authentication code was wrong, um, you would be able to it would take ever so slightly different amounts of time. So you can see in this top graph, it is quite noisy, um, and it requires quite a few iterations uh, and taking the average, but you can actually go through the message authentication code byte by byte, changing it until it takes ever so slightly longer to respond on average, and you know that that's the correct byte value. And by the time you've got through that, you've, you've got a, a packet with a valid message authentication code, and this doesn't require any eavesdropping now, and again, you can use the specialized hardware um, alongside the potentially the, um, 
the problems we discussed in the first attack to crack the machine-readable zone. And like I said, this requires a lot of iterations. Um, so it actually takes about 85 hours uh, of communication with the chip in order to get through and get cut through the noise and calculate what the actual correct keys are. And then you've got the additional time of actually cracking the keys. But an interesting thing is that um, I demonstrated at the beginning of this talk that the chip in all of our phones is perfectly capable of carrying out um, this exchange with the passport. Um, and it's not uncommon that people might keep their phone and passport in the same bag when they're traveling um, or in, the, uh, in their same pocket even. Um, so malware on the device could be used to carry out this attack, um, to communicate with the passport, try all these different combinations, extract the keys, and then after that, um, there's the even bigger problem of now you have an infected device next to the passport and it knows the keys, so it can do whatever it wants. So it could read all the data from the passport and send it to the attacker, or it could be used in a replay attack, for example, someone is trying to um, fraudulently go through the border. When they scan their passport, they could have some special chip in it that will communicate with, through the internet with the phone and relay the, um, the communication with um, the, the compromised passport. Um, so this is obviously a pretty big problem. So how can we mitigate it? Well, firstly, we need to standardize the timings and make sure that the chip doesn't leak information through the, through the timing of its responses um, by effectively making it keep going um, even after it fails and pretending to do work. Um, improving the entropy of the machine-readable zone was the solution given uh, at the time. Um, However, it, the encryption used is DES, which is, is now insecure and as of now can be, even if the, the machine readable zone is completely random, it's only 56 bits and it can be cracked nowadays using modern hardware in less than 24 hours. Um, one thing that prevents a lot of these attacks is shielding the chip so that it can only be read when the password is open because of, of course, thinking about it in the real world, you can only read my passport if it's open. Um, and the only time your passport ever needs to be read, you will have it open. So the US passport actually does this um, and has done since it was the biometrics were introduced to it. Um, but most other passports don't. Um, but then this still doesn't solve the problem of eavesdropping at the border. So what are we to do about the fundamentally insecure DES encryption? Well, the answer to that is just use something else. Um, so, uh, in the last um, 10, 15 years or so, um, a new uh, protocol was introduced called Password Authenticated Connection Establishment, which is an alternative uh, to basic access control that is intended to replace it, that uses asymmetric cryptography um, and generates strong session keys, no matter how predictable or insecure the password is. Uh, so, it's based on Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, and then further communication with the passport instead of using DES uses AES, and this is, of course, much, much more secure. And I'm not going to go into detail about how this works in this talk, but if you're interested, there's a uh, reference there, and it is, it is very interesting. So this sounds like it solves all of the problems. Um, and yes, in theory, it, it probably does. Um, but the problem with this is that it hasn't replaced basic access control yet, um, EU passports, while EU passports since 2014 have been required to implement it, until 2018, um, which is very recent, it was still required that they support basic access control. Um, and nowadays, um, all the passports that I've, I've tested my demo on, which the demo uses basic access control um, because PACE was far too complicated to implement, um, they've all worked absolutely fine. And while PACE prevents eavesdropping, um, if basic access control is still supported, then the third attack that we were talking about um, still, still applies and, and um, passports are still vulnerable. Um, but these are all things that will go away with time. And as, as we move forward and as um, basic access control um, is removed, passports will become much more secure. 
but that doesn't mean in the future passports will have no problems. Uh, in 2021, the International Civil Aviation Organization, um, which standardizes the machine readable and biometric passports, um, introduced another part of the chip which allows additional data to be stored. And this was the first time they introduced something to the passport that allows people to write to the passport uh, or that allows um, the, the passport to be written to at the border as well as when it's issued. Um, so as you can see, um, this is, this is the, um, the standard data before this is added. And then there's a whole other section for travel records, visa records, and additional biometrics. Um, so what this allows um, countries to do is when you go through the border, you can effectively get a digital stamp in your passport signed by the country you're going into saying absolutely without any question, this person entered this country at this time. So you can see here um, on, on this uh, diagram, this is the data that can go into this uh, entry or exit record. Um, and this might sound like a, a nice idea. You don't need to stamp the passport anymore. It's all digital. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. But the problem with this is it's not up to the country you're visiting whether to stamp your passport. Um, the standard says, if the country that issued the passport implemented this feature in the chip, then it is absolutely mandatory for any country you go into or out of to um, add a record to this, to this table. Um, which is a big problem because currently um, certain countries in the world that don't want visitors stigmatized or don't want their visitors not to be able to go to other countries uh, after visiting them can issue visas and record entries and exits on separate pieces of paper um, without actually putting them in the passport. But this standard requires that they do it uh, digitally um, and it's not even up to the country you're visiting as to whether they uh, record this information. So this is a problem, uh, but maybe even worse is the fact that um, these are completely irremovable and there's free form text fields as well. Um, so for example, a country could mark a person as suspicious in the result of inspection with no reason needed to be given and it could never be removed. Um, so in this way, any country could make anyone um, have a lot of trouble traveling if they are, can effectively write in big red letters in their passport, this person is suspicious, um, making it much harder for them to, uh, to travel and a big um, reduction in their, in their freedom. So in conclusion, biometric passports are absolutely a, a good thing. Uh, they allow for much faster border control without compromising security at all. Um, and most of the security issues with their implementation are fixed and just need time to be rolled out. Um, but I think it is concerning um, that something that originated as just an identity document uh, is now becoming more of a, uh, a log of everything you've done, um, allowing governments to keep track of your every movement. And I think the privacy issues uh, will only get worse from here. But that is it for my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, do you have any questions?